This is GMT on BBC World News. I'm David Eads in Brussels, where EU leaders must reach a unanimous view on any extra time for Brexit, just eight days before Britain is due to leave the European Union. The British Prime Minister, Theresa May, has made a direct address to the British people. Motion after motion and amendment after amendment has been tabled without Parliament ever deciding what it wants. All MPs have been willing to say is what they do not want. MPs across the House of Commons, though, reacted furiously to Mrs May's remarks last night. They said the Prime Minister must take responsibility for the Brexit turmoil. Instead of saying, look, I'm the Prime Minister, the buck stops here, she said, the buck stops over there. It, 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 don't blame me, I'm not responsible. And I'm Philippa Thomas in London. Our other top stories, a major policy change from New Zealand's Prime Minister, a dramatic response to Friday's gun attack on two mosques. And rescue teams are still struggling to reach survivors a week after Cyclone Idai hit Southeast Africa. Hundreds feared dead. And welcome to Brussels as we await the arrival of European Union leaders from right across the block as they gather with a very important decision to make. Will they grant the request coming from Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, for an extension to Brexit up until, as she has asked for, June the 30th? Uh, it would seem, from what we've heard so far, in particular from Donald Tusk, the European Council President, that there is a readiness to provide that extension, but conditions are attached. And the clearest condition of all is a simple one, that a vote on the deal that Mrs May has already agreed with the European Union must be taken next week, one would assume, because it's got to be before uh, March the 29th, and it must be passed, at which point an extension would be provided. What happens if the vote doesn't happen or if it isn't supported by a majority in Parliament? That is not a question at this point that's being addressed by Brussels. It is a feverish time in British and European politics. Chris Mason has this from Westminster. Theresa May heads to Brussels with the deafening noise of Westminster throbbing in her ears to formally ask for the very thing she was desperate to avoid, a delay to Brexit. Last night she tried to make the most of what being Prime Minister offers you, a Downing Street stage, an opportunity to rise above that din in the Commons and talk directly to the country. So far Parliament has done everything possible to avoid making a choice. Motion after motion and amendment after amendment has been tabled without Parliament ever deciding what it wants. All MPs have been willing to say is what they do not want. I passionately hope MPs will find a way to back the deal I've negotiated with the EU. A deal that delivers on the result of the referendum and is the very best deal negotiable. And I will continue to work night and day to secure the support of my colleagues, the DUP and others for this deal. Unlike Parliament, she claimed, I'm on your side. But the reaction from many MPs, the very people who will decide, probably next week, the fate of her plan, dripped with contempt. I will not support a government that takes such a dangerous, reckless approach to democracy. There is no way, given the language that she used tonight, that she is going to be able to reset this process in the next stages and have a genuine dialogue and search for the common ground, which is what this country badly needs. The Prime Ministers met the Westminster leaders of the opposition parties and Brexiteer Conservative MPs who publicly ponder how long she can stay in the job. There's no two ways about it. Uh, the buck does stop with the Prime Minister. You can't keep telling the British public that you're going to leave uh, on uh, the 29th of March 108 times from the dispatch box and then morph that into the 30th of June because the public are rightfully angry. Back here, there is a collective sense that this is it. That in the coming days, it'll be the responsibility of MPs to make some huge decisions. It is complete madness, one cabinet minister told me. Contemporary British politics 
has never seen anything like this before. Chris Mason, BBC News, at Westminster. Well, Chris calling it madness there. There is certainly a lot of fury in the air. You heard some of it in his report there from uh, some MPs, very unhappy with the way in which Theresa May has characterised the debates, the votes within Parliament, taking responsibility for the failure to get this through and putting it firmly on Parliament itself. And uh, uh, as I say, there are plenty of MPs who share that sense of frustration and anger. Among them, Barry Gardner, Labour MP. And, and this is the, 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 the craziness of her position last night, because instead of saying, look, I'm the Prime Minister, the buck stops here, she said, the buck stops over there, it, 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 don't blame me, I'm not responsible. But she is the one who for the past two and a half years has been insisting that only she can determine what is done. Can so I? If things have gone wrong, she needs to have the humility to look at herself and say, perhaps I should now start listening. Well, detractors clearly there, uh, but also supporters, among them the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. I think she was expressing extreme frustration with uh, the way this process has been going on. And I think she was also reflecting the fact that people at home are getting very frustrated that the process is going on and on and on and it's not resolving itself and people are worrying about what may or may not. Well, just thought we'd show you the bus going past there. Make love, not Brexit. Uh, uh, the message that, uh, well, everyone has got a message and they're pumping it out as hard as they can at the moment. Um, I want to have a word with Dan Dalton, who's a British MEP, Conservative MEP, who um, is A, with me now, Dan, but you've come straight back from, in fact, from Downing Street, where you were last night. You were addressed by Theresa May. That impassioned address she gave on television, did you get a bit of that as well last night? Yeah, I mean, with us, actually, she was very relaxed. And I think she made the key point that three years after the referendum result, to elect MEPs potentially in another European election would not be understood by people up and down the country. It would seem as if Brexit is not happening. I think that's a very strong point, and that was the point she made to us and then to, to the country afterwards in that address. And how was that received by, uh, presumably, most of the MEPs were very happy to hear that? Yeah, I mean, I, we, we respect the result of the referendum, and I think that's actually completely correct in terms of the approach we've got to take. There's no way we can have a European election at this stage. We voted for Brexit three years ago, whatever anyone felt on the issue. That decision was taken and we've now got to deliver that Brexit. And actually the deal that may get voted on next week in Parliament again is really the only way to deliver an orderly Brexit in the situation we're in now. But orderly Brexit is not, does not appear to be on the horizon, does it? And, it? and you can see the frustration here where it was signed, it was essentially signed, sealed and delivered in terms of the deal, and it just doesn't have the traction back home. Well. Hopefully, if the Speaker allows the vote, there will be another vote next week. I think it's still too close to say what the result will be, but there's definitely a chance that the go vote goes through next week, and then I think we're through this, this, this very difficult period. Um, but we don't know. Obviously, we don't know. But my, my view is it should, hopefully, go through next week. Well, that would be quite something. I mean, there is even a suggestion from some countries here, as you will know, that they're not necessarily of a mind to give the extension. And if they are going to, they want to hear some real guarantees about what Theresa May is planning to do. Do you know what these guarantees would be? Well, I think the first guarantee is depending on how long the extension is. I think a short extension till the end of June, which avoids European elections in the UK, could probably be given with a variety of, uh, of reasons, i.e. to continue to try and get the, the vote through or to try and come up with a new approach in the UK. A longer extension, I can understand from the European perspective that they want some guarantees if they're going to offer a longer extension that might mean European elections in the UK. But the French are saying, look, we'll, we'll take a short, we'll just take, get out, let's get out. This is, this is silly. Uh, they haven't managed to do it. We leave. No deal. Well, that would mean a no deal in just over a week's time. I think you'll find that from the European perspective as well as the UK perspective, neither side is ready for that. I mean, it's clear that the, the legislation here really isn't in place for a lot of the issues that need to be done. 
My view on that is that is probably a little bit of gamesmanship to try and change the result of the vote next week if it happens. I think if we actually come to the position next week where there hasn't been uh, a positive vote, I think you will find that a short extension will be given. Well, there's certainly been plenty of gamesmanship, Dan, that is true, and it will keep going on. Thanks very much indeed for joining us here in Brussels. In the short term then, uh, Philippa, of course, we just wait to see what the EU leaders are prepared to agree upon, and maybe some of that will depend on how well Theresa May can sell what it is she's asking for here. They want some clarity and some confidence from her that there will be a vote next week and it will go through. Whether she can provide that is another question. Well, let's go live now to David Eads, who joins us from Brussels. Over to you, David. Welcome then to the European Council. This is the scene for the next moment of drama in what feels like a never-ending Brexit saga. Theresa May has arrived here, as have all the other EU uh, leaders, so there are 28 in a room ready now to negotiate and discuss the possibility of that extension of the Brexit date itself. They know clearly what Mrs May is after. She's put it in a letter. They want to hear it from her as well, and they want to be persuaded that it's a good move and the right move to make at this point. Now, there has been a fairly clear indication for Theresa May coming from Donald Tusk, who is the president of the European Council, and it's a measure which has been mirrored almost exactly by the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, which suggests that, yes, indeed, a delay can be provided as long as there is a positive vote next week for the deal which Theresa May has already sorted out. But that's just a middle ground view and there are other, other views around that table which will be discussed over the course of the hours ahead. Let's just get a flavour of some of those because as the leaders have been coming into the uh, council this afternoon, they've been expressing their views. We'll start with the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, because he was asked what would happen if a third vote on the May deal still came out with a no. Then we will have uh, a second meeting of the European Council next week. President Macron, just to say, President Macron, just to say, do you expect to be back here next week in the event of another? In the event the uh, withdrawal agreement will not be approved by the House, we have to come back. President, you, what will you say to Theresa May tonight? Well, speaking to the media on his way into the uh, Brussels summit, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, put his own perspective on this. He warned that if British MPs reject the Brexit withdrawal agreement once again next week, then the UK will leave the EU without a deal. Look, I'm not here to command uh, uh, any other political system. I'm just here to say we do respect the vote of British people. We do respect what the Prime Minister and the Parliament are making. But we have to be clear. We can discuss and agree on an extension, if this is a technical extension, in case of a yes vote on the agreement we negotiated during two years. In case of a no vote or a no, I mean, directly, it will guide everybody to a no deal, for sure. Emmanuel Macron, the French president, one of the hardliners really in terms of where the uh, different countries position themselves at the moment. And the Austrian Chancellor, Sebastian Kurz, he also warned that no one wants a no-deal Brexit. I hope that uh, there will be support in the Parliament next week uh, because we all have the same interest to avoid a hard Brexit, to avoid a no-deal scenario. Uh, and so I hope that there will be a majority in the Parliament next week and uh, I hope that we can support Theresa May on that. But what happens if there isn't? Are you going to discuss that? Well, if there is no support in the Parliament, uh, then the no-deal scenario gets more and more realistical and that's not good for the UK but also not good for us in the European Union. Is there anything, you can do? anything else that the EU is running out with Theresa May? Well, the discussions are now underway in the European Council, but in her statement to the nation last night, the British Prime Minister blamed MPs for the prospect of delay to Brexit. She said that she was on the same side as voters, who she said were simply fed up with political games. Mrs May also said Parliament has done everything possible to avoid making a decision on the way forward. Her remarks, though, have provoked anger among many MPs. They've accused her of using inflammatory language, as our political correspondent Jonathan Blake reports. 
You're going to call on her to resign? Cabinet ministers keeping quiet in public the morning after the Prime Minister spoke from inside number 10. Calm comings and goings can't hide the tension in Westminster that came to a head last night. Theresa May pitched herself against Parliament and blamed MPs for the Brexit stalemate. So far, Parliament has done everything possible to avoid making a choice. Motion after motion and amendment after amendment has been tabled without Parliament ever deciding what it wants. Quickly and publicly, the backlash began. Opposition MPs and her own hit back. It's a bit rich, to be honest, her trying to blame us now when actually we've been doing all the right things in reaching out and trying to compromise. Instead of saying, look, I'm the Prime Minister, the buck stops here, she said, the buck stops over there. It, 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 don't blame me, I'm not responsible. We have a par representative parliamentary democracy and members of parliament cannot simply be asked to forfeit their judgment. And their judgment has been actually pretty clear that her deal is flawed. This cabinet minister defended the prime minister against claims she was pitching MPs against the public. I, I don't see it like that. I think all MPs have a um, responsibility and a need to make sure that we avoid no deal and we'll all be trying to do that over the next few days. Thank you. Thank you. Boris Johnson was unusually camera shy this morning. There's no sign Theresa May has persuaded him and others dead against her deal to budge. But there is some support from MPs who see it as the only option. Clearly she, she has moved mountains to try to get this deal through. And uh, there is the, the, the interesting thing is there, there is no, no other game in town. The government has confirmed it plans to give MPs another vote on the Prime Minister's Brexit deal next week. But if it doesn't pass third time round, what then? The choice that we have now is one of resolving this issue or extreme unpredictability. Do we resolve this or do we have Brexit paralysis? Warnings aside, some here said they felt less safe after the Prime Minister's statement last night. She didn't use this language, but the Speaker felt he had to make it clear. None of you is a traitor. All of you are doing your best. This should not be, and I'm sure will not prove, to be a matter of any controversy whatsoever. If Theresa May was hoping that MPs would forget their deep dislike for her Brexit deal and suddenly see the big picture, so far at least it seems she'll be disappointed. Her statement last night appeared to be an attempt at shock tactics, but it could have backfired. The DUP, whose votes are crucial to the Prime Minister, have said they won't be threatened into supporting her deal. Jonathan Blake, BBC News, Westminster. Well, amidst all the speculation, the extrapolation and, frankly, the exasperation, it's important still to focus on precisely what it is that Theresa May is asking for here at the European Council. To help us do that, our reality check correspondent Chris Morris is with me now. Chris, perhaps you could do that for us, just outline in clearest terms what it is she's after and, indeed, what sort of response she can expect to get. So we know that she wants a delay to Brexit, a three-month extension to the Article 50 period. At the moment it ends on the 29th of March, she suggested the 30th of June. She also wants the European Council to endorse the additional documents that were agreed 10 days or so ago. You'll remember the one about offering additional legal reassurance that the backstop in Ireland is never intended to be used and will only ever be temporary and so forth. The, the plan is that if that is done, she can then hopefully present that as a slightly new agreement because she wants to get her, her deal, the withdrawal agreement and the non-binding political declaration, first of all through a, a vote in the House of Commons and then use that extended Article 50 period if that vote were in favour to turn the withdrawal agreement into UK law. At that stage, once it gets ratified by the European Parliament as well, there'd be nothing to stop Brexit happening. But. What is the EU going to say about that? Well, we know that Donald Tusk has said yes, a short extension is possible, but first we want to see that vote go through the House of Commons next week. And there's one difficulty in terms of the potential length of a short extension. We've heard from several people, first of all from the European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker yesterday, European elections taking place towards the end of May. He's saying legally and politically you can't have an extension till the end of June. 
if you're not going to take part in those elections. Other, other people disagree with that, but it would appear that a lot of the countries gathered here are going to say the 22nd of May would be the longest short brief extension we could give you if you're not taking part in those elections. Yeah, we've heard some of the leaders coming in and offering actually a variety of views and yes. uh, some are quite hard line, some are very sympathetic. Nonetheless, this is the first time they all sit down together and that has, a, has its own dynamic, doesn't it? It does, and we always have to remember each of these 27 leaders has their own domestic political constituency to think of. They could set conditions. They've obviously been, dis be there have been discussions behind the scenes already. That's one of Donald Tusk's role to coordinate the response of the member states. The key thing to remember, though, is that all 27 have to agree. You can't have one country saying we object to that. It has to be a unanimous decision. So the first thing it appears that they want is for another meaningful vote. If the Speaker allows the Prime Minister to bring back the deal in what she regards as a slightly different form, a third vote in the House of Commons, if it were approved, it's a big if at the moment, a very big if, there'd also have to be a debate in the House of Lords, get through those hurdles and then, then we are looking at a short extension. But at the moment it doesn't look like the numbers in the House of Commons are there. No, and that's the point. What if they're not? Then what? Well, under, in, in, in terms of the law as it stands at the moment, the default position would be that we would leave with no deal. Under EU law and UK law, it would remain the case that the clock stops ticking on the 29th of March. Now, um, you know, what else could happen? Well, at the moment, Emmanuel Macron has said a no vote in the House of Commons guides us towards no deal. Would he say the same in a week's time? Or would he perhaps reluctantly agree with some other leaders who say, can we look at offering a longer delay? Now, what could a longer delay mean? Well, it could give time for perhaps a softer form of Brexit to emerge. We know there are MPs who are pushing this idea of a common market 2.0, a relationship a bit more like Norway's. You could change politics, maybe an election, even another referendum. Or, of course, if you like the nuclear option, it's there for the UK government to do unilaterally on its own if it wants to, revoke Article 50, cancel Brexit, which would mean the UK staying in the EU, uh, under the same terms that it has now. It would be highly controversial in the UK, of course, and it would just, it would probably cement the divisions we've seen over the last couple of years, but the government has the power to do that without the agreement of anyone else. Still so much potentially on the table. Chris, thank you very much indeed for laying all that out for us. So, as you can see, the, the permutations are still vast. Uh, there's a lot of effort going on back in Westminster to see what sort of order of business can be laid out in the course of the next week essentially to see if a, a vote can be had. That's another hurdle that has to be overcome, of course, and then where that might lead to. And they will be watching that very keenly here, of course, in the European Council. But what we have at the moment is this scenario. Theresa May talking to the other leaders, trying to persuade them that what she has put down on paper is the best option, is the best way to get the deal that she agreed with them through, and it will need a short extension. Let's get another view on that because Martina Anderson joins me now. Martina is an MEP for Sinn Féin MEP for Northern Ireland. And Martina, when this deal was done, which seems like forever ago now, I know your view then was it will get through, and you saw that as a, a calculated view, not a, a wish and hope. Have you lost all that hope now? Well, I think at this stage, most people would have expected eight days out that we would have had clarity. Uh, no one would have been expecting us to be here today with so much uncertainty. And, you know, we are where we are, and if people want to remove what they regard as a problem, there is a democratic, a legitimate pathway to remove that problem, and that's contained in the Good Friday Agreement. Theresa May and her government is a co-guarantor of that agreement. So if the border partition in Ireland has been seen as a problem, then there is a legitimate endorsed way that that can be removed. Right. I mean, there are going to be plenty of people, not least MPs, who say, well, hang on a minute, Sinn Féin, you have MPs who could be playing a role in Westminster on this line. You don't want to come to the party, so it's not really for you to make those sorts of declarations. You're going to either take part or you've got to sit it out. Well, you see, for the people of Ireland, for the people of the north of Ireland who have voted for Sinn Féin, um, I would say collectively the majority of them realise that nothing good has ever come out of the House of Commons for Ireland, and particularly for the north of Ireland. And I think the vote for the, of the people needs to be respected. People voted for abstentionist MPs 
and knew that we were not going to be taking our seats. So leaving that aside, I'm not actually talking about something that's going to be voted on in the House of Commons. It's no, already been no, voted fine. on. But it's let, agreed. Sure, but let, let's just focus on, on what we have here, yeah, which yeah. is uh, possibly an extension provided another vote takes place and gets through. Now, you did think at one point that would happen. Is your view that if, let's say, it takes place next Monday, it will fall again? Well, whilst we were saying that it would, you know, if, if any of the MPs were going to assess the damage that was going to be done to their people, like 50% of the medicine that comes into Britain comes from the EU, then one would imagine that when they would be calculating all of those things, then they would have voted for the least worst option. You know, the deal that was agreed was not designated special status for the North to remain within the EU, but it was protecting the peace process, and who in their right mind wants to do any damage to the peace process in the border partition in Ireland. So whilst that is not the case, you know, I respect the fact that MPs will vote how they do because they are British MPs. We are on the side of the table, we believe that matters, and that's the side of the table the negotiations is taking place here, and that's where we're having our influence. Okay. And there is a solution to the problem. Right, okay. And I know you don't want to talk about well, it, it's not but so lots of people are talking about it, particularly even today yes. in Ireland, because of the chaos of what's that's happening. Fine. I should also point out that the members of the DUP who, who are part of the process within Westminster, they would say exactly the same about the absolute importance of protecting uh, the Good Friday Agreement and the terms could, of could it. Also I just want to get that okay. balance in, Martina. Like, no, I can't go on that. We've made the point. But they were the only party that we've, voted against it. We, we've, we've made that <laughs> So that needs though. to be said okay, to the Martina. people of England and the people of Britain. They okay. were the only thank, party that voted against the Good you. Friday Agreement. Yeah, you made your point. Thank you very thank much you indeed, very much. Martina. Thank Thanks for joining us. So as you can see, the arguments will go on whatever happens here. But in the short term, we've got to work out is Theresa May going to head back to London with the deal she needs at least to get over the next hurdle, which is the possibility of a vote next week, uh, and with the view that there would then be at least weeks, if not the full three months even, for her to get this Brexit deal through. This is BBC World News. Theresa May is here in Brussels asking EU leaders to delay Brexit. But a short extension would give Parliament the time to make a final choice that delivers on the result of the referendum. In the last few minutes, EU leaders say they will grant her an extension until May the 22nd to give the House of Commons time to pass Theresa May's Brexit deal. But MPs at home are furious with Theresa May and behind the smiles here in Brussels, European leaders are running out of patience. Hello, I'm Tim Wilcox here in London. Also on Global Today, a lightning fast political response to the mosque massacres in New Zealand. The Prime Minister announces sweeping new gun laws to include the banning and buyback of all assault rifles. And how global warming is revealing the long lost climbers of Everest whose bodies were once entombed in ice. This is Global. Very good afternoon from Brussels. It is febrile here in the journalist room. It is that moment in a European summit when the draft conclusions are published and everybody goes through the text to see what those 27 EU leaders might have decided. That is what makes these summits so fascinating. 27 leaders on their own, locked in a room without their advisers, debating among themselves what they should do next. And Theresa May has been speaking to them for quite some time this afternoon, longer than we might have expected. We were told she spoke to them for 90 minutes. She put her plan on the table. There was a question and answer session several times. She was asked by the European leaders what would happen if her deal is defeated for a third time next week. And at the end of all that, we have just been given these draft conclusions from the EU leaders, which suggest that there will be an extension granted by the European Union Council uh, until May the 22nd. So that is just the day before uh, the European parliamentary elections. So long as 
and this was set down by Donald Tusk, the European Council President, so long as the House of Commons passes Theresa May's deal next week. So they're putting the onus firmly on the British Parliament and the sensitivity around this was really demonstrated by the fact that the conclusions weren't emailed uh, to the leaders as they often are, exchanged electronically, but in fact they were posted to the leaders and the different delegations today in envelopes so sensitive with the details that were in it. And that's because there were various options that were on the table. Uh, other EU institutions wanted the extension to be much shorter. Uh, in the end, they've come to a compromise on May the 22nd. So let's have a listen to Therese May. She did speak before she went into the room. This is what she had to say. What is important is that Parliament delivers on the result of the referendum and that we deliver Brexit for the British people. I sincerely hope that we can do that with a deal. I'm still working on ensuring that Parliament can agree a deal so that we can leave in an orderly way. What matters is that we deliver on the vote of the British people. But if Thank it you. fails, Prime Minister, if it fails. What matters, what matters is that we recognise that Brexit is the decision of the British people. We need to deliver on that. We're nearly three years on from the original vote. It is now the time for Parliament to decide. A short extension gives us that opportunity to decide uh, to ha leave the European Union, to deliver on the, that result of that referendum. And I sincerely hope that will be with a negotiated deal. Theresa May speaking on the way into the room a little earlier today. Let's go to Westminster and speak to our correspondent, Rob Watson, who's there. Rob, I'm just reading through these draft conclusions. Uh, we've not been able to go through all of it, but there's a line that uh, is interesting to me. It's this one. Given that the UK does not intend to hold elections to the European Parliament, no extension is possible beyond that date. Now, for that line to be put in the draft conclusions, you would anticipate that Theresa May must have spelled out to the European leaders that she has no intention of fielding candidates. Would, would you agree? I, I, I would, absolutely. And it, it also seems to me that it's saying that the European Union is saying back to the UK, look, unless you completely change your approach to Brexit, that is it. It's all over uh, at the end of next week. I was going to ask you a question, Christian, which is, can you remember the last time the two of us were standing exactly where you are now? It was three years ago when David Cameron was negotiating the... Um, uh, the, the new relationship with the EU that he hoped to put to the British people in the referendum. And I, I was just thinking about it, seeing you there and everybody else there, that you know, people would have been very surprised if they said three years later the UK's international reputation would be in pretty much free fall and its domestic uh, politics in utter chaos. Yes. Well, Mark Rutte, the, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, really summed it up perfectly this afternoon. He said, look, we've got a week and one day to go, and quite frankly, we are no closer to a solution. They must have discussed in the room uh, this afternoon, Rob, what happens if this deal does not go through next week, because they read the British papers, they hear the comments from Westminster, and nobody at this point thinks she's going to get the votes that she needs. You're quite right uh, and one suspects that presumably that the European politicians have sort of picked up on it seems to me what has really changed in the last in the last hour in the last day or so and that is what politicians here feel to be a hardening of Theresa May's position and what I mean by that is the sense that she is now saying to MPs and to the country look you get one last chance next week to vote for my deal if not, I am not bluffing, we really, really would leave the European Union uh, without a deal next Friday. And it seems to me the, the big question, that I was going to say in British politics, but actually in European politics and beyond is, if MPs, if, if she really is serious about that, her deal or no deal, those MPs who don't like that idea, either no deal or her deal, what, if anything, can they do to stop her? Because otherwise, th there would seem to be a strong chance that Britain could leave the European Union without a deal next Friday. OK, Rob Watson in Westminster, thank you very much indeed. Let me introduce you to Esther Zalan, who is uh, a journalist with EU Observer. I'm sure you've just been going through those draft conclusions. Do we take it, then, that the UK side has confirmed here today that they won't be taking part in those European elections and this is the only extension that will be granted. 
if, if there is an extension granted, this is the only extension that will be granted. If, you know, the other option is for the UK to completely change its Brexit strategy and have a very long extension with possibly European elections. But for now, this is the longest uh, the EU leaders can go. Yes, unless they change their mind, of course, and day-to-day -day Brexit does tend to change. Um, do they think, when they're in the room, and they're obviously considering all the options, and they're now talking without Theresa May there, she's left the room and they're going to discuss it among themselves, do they, would they have a concern that even if there is an alternative plan that is put forward by the House of Commons, they're still going to need a Prime Minister to carry it across the line and legislate for it? It's one thing to get the votes for an alternative plan, it's quite another to see it through to the end. Exactly, and so far, I mean, uh, Prime Minister May has been letting EU leaders down. I, I, I think that's how, how they feel. They've been telling Prime Minister May to get a plan ready for them to be able to help her. So I think they're very skeptical at this point with any uh, plans and any sort of uh, uh, UK leadership. It's always interesting hearing the, the different opinions you get from the EU leaders going into the building. Emmanuel Macron, who of course has driven the hardest line uh, so far, saying, well, really spelling out the obvious, that unless there is an alternative plan next week, if there is no approval of Theresa May's deal, the only alternative on the table is no deal, or you enough. revoke Article 50, and you're not going to get a, a Conservative Prime Minister revoking Article 50. Exactly, and I, I think at this point uh, EU leaders are also weighing the option, what, what is more costly for the, for the EU as a whole, a no deal or continued uncertainty with no clarity from the UK side. So I think that's, you know, which, which, which is the less of the two evils, I think that's what's on the EU leaders' mind right now. No deal has certainly gone up in the, in the betting stakes in, in the last 24 hours. She used to say it was no Brexit if you didn't back the deal. Now she's saying it's no deal if you don't back the plan that's on the table. And you're hearing similar thoughts from European leaders, but I just, I just wonder if, if really that is the plan, because the economic pain for all those countries around the United Kingdom would be severe. It would be more severe for the UK. But for Ireland, do they really want to throw Ireland under the bus? I don't think they want to throw Ireland on the bus. I mean, it was obviously on both sides. It was it's there a little bit of who's bluffing uh, and really who's going to blink first. But I think on the other hand, the EU really wants to stick to its unity and protect the integrity of the elections of EU legislation. So I think it all it come this this has an increasing uh, thought in the EU's EU leaders' minds. Well, I'm sure that is the plan. But then you hear the Irish Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, saying, "Hang on, guys, let's not get too hasty. I know there's Brexit fatigue out there, but let's." cut the UK side some slack? Uh, I don't think there will be any changes to the withdrawal agreement, for instance, uh, significantly. Uh, I think this is as far as the EU could go, and I think that the frustration is boiling over, and now they're really uh, weighing on, on how much no deal would cost and whether continued uncertainty is, is, is more costly, in fact. Let's just go back to that thought that even though she's told them today she's not taking part in the European elections, if she blinks and says, actually, we are going to need more time, there is a natural cutoff because by, I think, by the 18th of April, the, the UK would have to have put candidates forward. Uh, I, yes, I think so. So, I mean, there, there would that's be only... only three weeks away. That's only three weeks away. Um, I mean, obviously, if there's a political will, there's, there's usually a legal solution in the, in the EU. So I've heard ideas floating around of continued uh, um, membership for, for those MEPs, UK MEPs who are already in the Parliament, if uh, possibility for the Parliament to nominate uh, MEPs, uh, but the decision will have to be made whether the UK wants to uh, stay a member beyond uh, the European elections. Uh, Esther Zalan, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. If you are just joining us, just to remind you that we have had the draft conclusions from the EU leaders and we are told that there will be a short extension to Brexit uh, instead of the 29th of March, which is of course the leaving date. Uh, they are saying they're prepared to extend until May the 22nd, which is the day before the European Parliament. Although I must remind you, as we've reminded you all along, the date that is set down in statute, in law, in the House of Commons is the 29th, so they would have to pass new legislation to extend to that date. Well, let's speak to Baroness Angela Smith, the Labour peer. She's the leader of the Labour Party in the House of Lords. Baroness Smith, good to talk to you. And to you. 
Uh, what do you make of the draft conclusions that are coming out of the summit here in Brussels? An extension until the 22nd, but some thought that maybe the Prime Minister has ruled out the UK taking part in the European elections. Well, I don't think it's actually a surprise what we've heard. Um, where it gets difficult is how that is going to be affected because if she's insisted on getting the same deal through that is going to be very difficult I think to get that through Parliament given she's been so unwilling to listen to MPs I've always felt that from when MPs voted to respect the result of the referendum, they invoked Article 50, by engaging MPs there could have been a sensible compromise, a sensible Brexit and a way forward. And I think the Prime Minister has really run the clock down with her own intransigent view of Brexit, knowing it didn't have the support of MPs, but just keeps bringing it back again and again. So it's very difficult to see what's going to happen next week. And I think MPs are already very angry with her after her comments last night, blaming everybody but herself and putting MPs in a very difficult position. So to win round more MPs to support her deal is very difficult for her. Yes, of course, there's been criticism of your leader as well, Jeremy Corbyn. He was invited to a face-to-face -face meeting with the Prime Minister last night and left the room because Chuka Amuna, former Labour MP, was, was there. He, this is a moment where the country is facing a national crisis. Don't we need everybody to pull together? Well, yes, and he actually he spoke to her later for about 20 minutes. But what I hear of that meeting, it wasn't really worth the time that was spent because what Jeremy Corbyn and I think the other leaders wanted was the opportunity to talk to the Prime Minister and to see where there can be some progress in looking at sort of meet the objectives that MPs have said that isn't her deal, but there is a deal that is possible to do. And yet she's not willing to consider that. So if the Prime Minister isn't prepared to listen to others, then no amount of meetings, no, no number of hours in meetings is going to make any different and I think it's that tin ear and deafness of the Prime Minister that has taken us to this point. I thought last night I have to say that her attack on MPs that it was everybody's fault except hers was quite extraordinary. Now MPs have been grappling with this they voted to invoke Article 50 they've been trying to find a way forward and all she's wanted to do is put her own version and say this is the best I can do and not listen to anybody else and then get into that position so close to the deadline and blame everybody else is not the way I believe a responsible Prime Minister should behave. OK, but the UK is where it is at the moment. I've asked other people today for their versions of what happens next week. What do you think is likely to happen when she presents that deal? And do you think there is a solution that she would carry across the line in terms of all the legislation that would have to be passed? Because it's one thing, as I was saying to Esther, to get a vote for a plan. It's quite another to legislate for it. I don't think there'd be any difficulty in getting a date change in the legislation. That's a fairly straightforward matter. It's a simple piece of secondary legislation. And though there'll be debates and votes on it, I think most MPs would support that. I think the difficulty is in her own deal. And having been rejected so many times, she's never wanted to change anything. And I think that's where it gets difficult. But the House of Commons, I've always believed, would come forward with a responsible solution. Now, I think what we're going to see next week is MPs being very sort of, I think, vocal and really wanting her to do something different. But it's hard to know when she's prepared to listen. And that, I think, has been the problem all along. So I'm quite worried about what will happen next week. It's hard to imagine, really, and I've always thought that this Prime Minister, having seen all the documents and knowing the consequences of leaving the European Union without a deal, would never take us to that brink. I have to say, here in her last night and then today, I'm fearful that she has sort of lost judgment on this issue because the fact she could even contemplate um, leaving without a deal, knowing the consequences, is so irresponsible and dangerous to our country. We know, we've seen today already a letter from the head of the CBI and the TUC jointly saying you can't make it your deal or no deal that's not in the British interests so when people, other people come together to say that to the Prime Minister surely at some point she has to listen so I think you know we ought to give some MPs the time and the space next week this is going to be very very difficult for them and it's not their fault I have to say I put the blame fairly and squarely at the door of the Prime Minister. Okay Baroness Angela Smith, Labour peer, thank you very much indeed. Just to say that we are expecting press conferences in the course of the next hour. We will, of course, bring you the details from that as and when we have it. Let's just bring in Christian again, live with us from Brussels. Um, I'm curious, Christian, are they trying to do anything else at this summit? 
<laughs> they were supposed to be talking about China this evening and the European Union's relationships with China and how it's going to develop, but they're into dinner now and they are still talking about Brexit, as they have been since about three o'clock this afternoon, which tells you there is an awful lot to discuss. Let's bring in uh, our reality check correspondent, Chris Morris, and our Europe editor, Katia Adler. You're allowed to yawn. It is that bad at the moment. She we, wasn't we're gonna, yawning. She was. She was. You are no, allowed. I, I, was I sort of think. Remembering that I had spinach for dinner and just worrying about <laughs> it was I'm about to talk to you if you really want to know. Anyway, Christian, Let's move on. ask us about Brexit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, tell me what you're learning from all the various <laughs> huddles around the room. I'm intrigued. Well, there's quite a lot of disagreement going on in there. And um, I think it's interesting because the disagreement is laid out for everybody to see. And up until now, during the Brexit process, these normally squabbling EU member states have been able to say, we are unified. And they're not unified tonight. And um, they're arguing about the details. They're sort of really faced with the prospect of a no deal Brexit, which we've heard lots of very sort of forthright statements in the last days of, you know, we need these conditions or we won't give an extension. Whereas now they're really faced with the possibility for no deal it's focusing minds but not all the 27 minds are in, in exactly the same position do you think they're still focusing on Theresa May getting this deal through next week it that's part of plan a for certain and when you actually think about the UK's position now here's a country that more than two years ago announced with some fanfare we're taking back control and now this evening we're sitting here with 27 other countries behind closed doors apparently deciding what's going to happen next while Theresa May sits outside wondering what they're going to decide that in itself is is fairly extraordinary but yes if possible I think they'd all love if this meaningful vote could go through the House of Commons next week get debated in the House of Lords and then we move on to turn it into legislation and Brexit happens but they can read the runes as well as you or I. They see the numbers in the House of Commons and they have to accept that it's probably unlikely to happen. It's not certain that it won't happen, but the numbers don't look good for the government. And if that vote doesn't go through, they have to be thinking about a plan B as well. And as Katya said, it, it, there are no easy options there. No. And so that's why it's taking a, a, a little bit of time to get there. It, it would be set, uh, there's all sorts of rumour flying around, let's not go back to all the dates, but it would make sense if you had a small extension to see if you can get the deal through or any other deal and, and you give some space for that. But if it doesn't happen, you have to then commit to the European election. So you have a, a small extension. And then if you do get the deal through, perhaps a bigger extension so you can get all the legislation through. That would tend to make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, or even a bigger extension so that if the deal doesn't get through and therefore you don't need a small bit of extra time to get the legislation through, you have a much bigger space in order to think again. That doesn't necessarily mean the UK thinking again and staying in the European Union. It just means think again and try and get MPs to agree a particular way forward. Is it a general election? Is it a second referendum? Uh, is it a softer kind of Brexit? What kind of Brexit is it? Because, I mean, you know, I've been here day after day after day now um, for many, many, many months and the EU's kept saying it's not good enough to tell us what you don't want, UK. You absolutely need to tell us what you do want. And Theresa May has had her red lines and she's, but a lot of what she's wanted simply hasn't added up, Christian. You can't leave the customs union and the single market and have friction-free trade and not have a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland and not have a border in the Irish Sea. Those things just don't add up. Yeah. And I think also to a certain extent, and we were just talking about this before we came to talk to you, um, was the fact that the EU didn't just kind of let that be out there. <clears throat> and of course, they came with the Irish backstop and so on, but they allowed the UK to try and look for other solutions, whereas they believed there weren't any other solutions. And I think tonight they're realizing that. And, you know, I've. I, more than one person, diplomat from an EU country, has said to me, you know what, maybe we should have been clearer from earlier on mm. what is possible and what isn't possible, and maybe we wouldn't be here tonight. But of course, hindsight. You see, Theresa May's deal leaves all that open, because we're only talking about the withdrawal agreement, the divorce, the future relationship is eight pages long, and, and, and we could well, very well, with Theresa May's deal, end up in a full customs union. Equally, if they go for the other option, which is banded around now, this Norway Plus option, Common Market 2, it very likely comes with a customs union. Well, and one of the interesting things about all these options, if, if for example, there were to be what's being called the series of indicative votes in the House of Commons next week, and, and, the, and, the, and MPs coalesce around a single option, 
That option could be written somehow into the political declaration, but of course it's non-binding, which means a future government after another election could go off on a completely different course. And so it comes back to this issue which is, has worried many people, okay. that this could be a blind Brexit. OK, Chris Morris, Cassia Adler, we'll keep watching. Thank you very much. Back to you, Rob. Our political editor, Nick Waters in Brussels, and has the latest. Nick, over to you. Yes, well, as you say, EU leaders have taken great pride that they've been united on Brexit, but tonight those divisions were out in the open. But as you say, just finally got there over the line. And it looks like what they've agreed tonight uh, is that uh, there can be an extension of the Article 50 process until the 22nd of May if Parliament approves Theresa May's deal next week. If it doesn't approve it, then the extension is until the 12th of April. But before then, the UK would have to give an indication if it would what what its way forward would be would it be willing to take part in european parliamentary elections and that could possibly lead to a longer extension so what this means is big pressure next week for the prime minister to get her deal through but if it fails to get through then we don't leave next friday which means potentially space for other options and maybe potentially a space for a longer extension if the UK took part in those European parliamentary elections. Now, it was a very difficult evening, as you say, 20-minute grilling of Theresa May. She was repeatedly asked, what happens if your deal's not endorsed by Parliament? Answer came there, none. Um, and it was also obviously the first public disagreement. France really, really wanted to turn the screw and say UK would be out by the 7th of May. But old allies like the Netherlands and Germany, well, they weighed in and said, can we just keep the door open for a little longer? So realistically, what does this mean for the UK? Well, if the Prime Minister's deal goes through, then it will be, as she said, an orderly Brexit. If it doesn't get through, there is now the potential of a window for alternative options. Um, we were reporting last night that there's a cross-party attempt to seize the Commons order paper next Wednesday for indicative votes. And the front runner is this thing called Common Market 2.0, a customs arrangement and a close relationship with the single market. There's a lot of feeling that the Labour Party and sort of Tory Remainers could weigh in behind that. Now, Jeremy Corbyn was getting quite strong support in Brussels today behind what he calls a close economic partnership. But the message to him is time is unbelievably short. Parliament's got to agree this next week or the week after. If not, it ain't going to happen. So quite a day. And here's how it panned out. So with that, Donald Tusk and Jean-Claude Juncker wrap up uh, their press conference for the evening. We are expecting, I should say, uh, Theresa May to give a statement later this evening. So maybe uh, that will come in the next few minutes. And of course, we will bring you that when she appears. Um, I think there's one or two things that we should just take out of that press conference. First of all, um, Jean-Claude Juncker setting out the efforts and the lengths that they had gone to to support Theresa May throughout. He talked about the clarifications they'd offered in December, the assurances they'd given in January, uh, the extra legal assurance they tried to give in Strasbourg, which was approved tonight uh, in February. Uh, and what I think has been going on through some part of the evening, according to people who I've spoken to here, is there is um, an attempt to ensure ahead of the European elections that if it comes to a no deal, the European Union is not blamed for it. And I think you're, you're already starting to see senior European figures pointing out that they've done everything they feel they could do within the parameters that they've set themselves to avoid a no deal Brexit. Now, why is that important? Well, because there is reporting around tonight in the Financial Times and from briefing that we had here that the Theresa May has in fact reconciled herself to no deal if she can't get her deal through. Now, obviously, there would be an enormous pushback from uh, the House of Commons if that was the case, and there would be cabinet resignations, and no doubt there would be some remainers on her benches who would perhaps even try to bring the government down. But apparently, after such an acrimonious uh, debate within the cabinet in the early hours of Wednesday morning, she got to a position where she thought she could take the UK out without a deal. And somebody told me tonight that the reporting from the Financial Times um, was relatively accurate to what they'd heard in the Q&A session within 
uh, the summit. Uh, let's bring in Chris Mason, uh, who is in Westminster for us this evening. Uh, and Chris, just obviously that question that Gavin Lee asked got a response from Donald Tusk, which was very different to what I expected, actually, because he then said, well, actually, what we've discussed today has been pretty positive. There are still options open to us. They've obviously granted that extension. So maybe they, they don't think she's real, that she is going to take Britain out without a deal. Yeah, I think the key point, Christian, to emphasise, you were just making the point there that after all of this uh, countdown towards the summit and a huge amount of speculation around the prospect of a, a delay, that that delay has been agreed, that the UK, uh, subject to a change in the law here next week, isn't going to be leaving the European Union and it's 11 o'clock at night uh, a week tomorrow, the date we've been counting down to uh, for the next for the last uh, two years providing a window not a particularly wide one but a window where the Prime Minister can either have another crack at getting her withdrawal agreement with Brussels through Parliament or Parliament can try and cook up an alternative strategy but the window remains very tight because of that deadline that Britain is desperate to meet to try and sort something out before it is obliged uh, to submit candidates to contest at the European Parliament elections. Yeah, that is a natural cut-off point, isn't it, at the 12th of, of April, because if you don't put those candidates forward, then de facto you are leaving the European Union, and they've made that clear. The very fact that Jean-Claude Juncker then went on to spell out the preparations that they're making, and they make this clear in, in the conclusions they've come to tonight, that the no-deal planning continues. We're hearing from reporting in the UK tonight, Chris, that uh, Operation Yellowhammer, the UK's preparations for this, are go next week. That tells us, though, doesn't it, that no deal is still very much on the table? Yeah, it, it absolutely is, for two reasons. One, because, let's remember, despite the agreement in Brussels tonight, it remains the law of the land here in the UK that we're due to leave next Friday, unless that law is changed. But secondly, even if it is changed, which is more likely than not, uh, it is a delay to that prospect rather than the cancellation of that prospect. Now, there's been reports in the last few days that this Operation, Operation Yellowhammer, last minute contingency planning for no deal. The button on that was due to be pressed uh, on Monday in just a couple of days. That wasn't denied when we put it to Downing Street. Uh, I think it was yesterday, all the days merge into one at the moment. And we've heard tonight, haven't we? And you've been reporting Jonathan Beale, our defence correspondent, saying that the Ministry of Defence uh, has activated its plans, which could see the deployment of up to three and a half thousand troops uh, as part of contingency planning uh, around no deal. So it absolutely remains a live possibility. Now the government has made the case here that it's been doing extensive planning for some time and has really stepped that up since December. Now there really isn't a political will amongst the vast majority at Westminster to see a no deal scenario, but so fluid are things at the moment that it's still not impossible. And as I say, let's emphasise the key point. Uh, it remains the law of the land. It remains the default option until that law is changed uh, in the next couple of days. Of course, Theresa May is the professional kicker of the can and she's kicked the can as far down the road as she possibly can. Do you sense, Chris, that now we've got this very narrow window, really, of three weeks to the 12th of April, that no longer can she ride two horses? She has to pick one next week. Yeah, something has to happen and it has to happen pretty quickly and that's what's informing the mood here at Westminster, that there's been no end of prevarication because there's been the scope for it up until now, in other words the time hadn't run out and there was always an expectation that we could reach this kind of crunch point. But we now know that next week MPs have to take a crucial decision on authorising that delay uh, and changing British law. We know that on Monday they'll have an opportunity, perhaps the first of a number, to flesh out whether or not they can find a majority for anything else other than the Prime Minister's deal. That is stipulated in the law as a result of the government defeat on the second uh, meaningful vote. And then at some stage there is going to be another attempt from the government to bring back uh, the meaningful vote to uh, the Commons. And obviously the EU has set down a parameter around them having a go next week uh, around one of those uh, departure dates. But crucially, well there's two crucial points. Firstly, the government has to convince the Speaker John Burko that there has been a substantial change of circumstances around the tabling of that vote. His ruling earlier in the week that you can't keep tabling the same thing over and over again. The government's argument, I think, is likely to be, look, the substantial changes that the departure date has moved. But secondly, the government's going to try and get the numbers. And things do not look good on that front. And actually, the removal, as we expect, 
of the No Deal Cliff Edge, as its critics see it next Friday, actually removes a bit of the jeopardy around a vote next week because the prospect of a No Deal Brexit might have gone, which may mean the government holds on, gives itself a bit more time to try and get the numbers uh, and holds that vote a little later. Chris, stay with us because I just want to show people the room here in the council building where Theresa May is going to appear. There is the lectern. Of course, we will take you to the lectern when Theresa May appears. But for people who are just joining us, let's quickly go through Chris has been doing it very eloquently, but let's quickly just show you on screen what has been agreed uh, by the EU Council this evening. So in the past hour, they've confirmed that the leaders have agreed on the plan to delay the Article 50 process. Uh, the EU have agreed to an extension, as Chris said, until the 22nd of May, provided, provided the withdrawal agreement, uh, the Prime Minister's deal, is agreed to. Now, if the withdrawal agreement does not pass, this is the second scenario. The EU has agreed to an extension until the 12th of April and expects the UK to indicate a way forward before that date. And the 12th of April is important because that is the cutoff date that the UK would have to inform the EU whether it was taking part in the European elections. And again, they reiterate tonight that the withdrawal agreement cannot be reopened. I should say two things. Uh, this agreement ensures uh, Chris Mason, if you're still with us, that there's not going to be a summit on Thursday. I understand Emmanuel Macron pushed back against that. He didn't want to come back next Thursday. So they've set two scenarios out, which will at least get them until the 12th of April. And I think the second scenario, which we should also impress on people, is that those legal documents that were agreed in Strasbourg a week last Monday, that has now been put into the withdrawal agreement and forms part of the package. And that is important in trying to get the DUP across the line. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. So yeah, just picking up on that point you were discussing there about the, the prospect that has been discussed at some length up till now about uh, a potential emergency summit at the tail end of next week. One assumes the chances of that has receded. I just insert one caveat, which is that... and. <laughs> You can never predict what's going to happen here at Westminster. If there was any problems, as the government would see it, trying to change British law around our departure date at the end of next week, then, you know, who knows where we might be. But I think in all likelihood that will resolve itself. And so uh, the big moment of potential jeopardy uh, or excitement, depending on your point of view, at the end of next week uh, will recede, removing the need for any uh, emergency gathering of uh, European leaders but not removing it entirely, just kicking it a little bit down the road, either into no. uh, mid-April or the tail end of May. Just, this is the point where we start disappearing down a rabbit hole, but there are two dates on this agreement, and there has to be a legal instrument on Monday to change the 29th of March. Which date did they put on the legislation? I've spent the last couple of years down rabbit holes, Christian, so, uh, you know, welcome to the borough. Uh, it's a little dark in here and it's not always easy to find the way out, but it's a huge amount of fun nonetheless. Um, that's a very good question and there's been an open question here about the extent to which it'll be obligatory uh, on the government's part to actually insert a date. Now, the expectation from some of the people I was speaking to is that because there's a date there in, the, in there at the moment, then you scratch that out and logic suggests you put in another one. Um, but clearly there's a slight issue here around the fact that there are two. Now whether you can bind into it both options, so here is the first possibility uh, and here is the second, it may be of course if there isn't a meaningful vote next week then one of those options is immediately struck out because uh, one of those options is contingent on there being another vote next week. Um, it is a boom time for constitutional experts and practitioners and their phones are going to be ringing even more loudly. Uh, in the next 42, 48, 72 hours, I suspect. Chris, I hope you'll stay with us because we are waiting for the Prime Minister and we will go straight to that when Theresa May appears. But I just want to bring in Barbara Vesel, who works for Deutsche Welle. Uh, she talks to us a lot on the BBC. Uh, go on. Uh, we've, we've set out what has been agreed. You tell us what you've been hearing about what went on this evening. Well, there was a lot of back and forth between different dates because there were, of course, different interests in the room. You know, the French president wanted the date to be as far away from the European elections as possible because he didn't, you know, want to stir up his own nationalist right. 
Um, Angela Merkel, the only thing she wants is an orderly Brexit. She doesn't care about the date. Whichever date is fine with her, but she wants to get it done. And other people had other concerns. And so there was a lot of back and forth. How do we solve the solution? And what do we do about the conditionality? Because the point was, was that, that the EU had sort of built itself a trap. You know, they had put the conditionality down um, with regard to the extension and then said, okay, next deal, next week you have to push this deal through Parliament, otherwise there's not going to be an extension. So we were sort of, ah, there's going to be a cliff edge Brexit next Friday. What are they doing there? I mean, what sort of strategy is that? And so they took that back. Right, okay. Um, one of the European teams, I better not mention which team it was, uh, Chatham House Rules, but they felt and they don't know whether the Prime Minister's bluffing, but they think that the Financial Times reporting tonight that the Prime Minister is reconciled to no deal seemed accurate from what she was telling them in the room. What is the German camp saying? Um, they're, they're always being very cautious with that because uh, they always say, you know, what happens in the room stays in the room. But uh, of course the feeling is that she didn't present a plan B. I mean, she simply didn't come up with anything. She didn't answer any of the questions. And the questions that we have put to her over and over again, you know, Prime it's Minister... What happens if it's not your deal? Exactly. What happens? What are you going to do? She wouldn't answer that. So that is an indication for her sort of giving up in that sense and saying, OK, if the deal isn't pushed through, if I can't manage, which she must know, mm. then, yeah, you know... Mm. The source I, I, that spoke to me said it was almost a hands-in-the-air moment, whatever. Sort of, yeah, right, in that sense, like, you know, there's no planned deal. If it, if it goes wrong again, it goes wrong, and we're all in God's hand, like, you know, on, on the high seas, yeah. that sort of feeling. Uh, Chris was just saying, very good point, um, who we're talking to in Westminster, that, of course, they might have to come back next week if they can't get the legislation to shift the date. But they don't want to come back next week, and that's why they've put these two dates in the they've, conclusion. They've put these two dates, it's actually quite smart because they... Here she is. Let's just listen in. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, so to confirm, I don't think we're now looking at uh, a summit next Thursday, one day before Brexit. The French president appears to have got his way uh, and kicked it a little bit further down the road. With me is our Brussels correspondent, Adam Fleming. Um, we're waiting for this legal document. There's still a lot of discussion going on. What are you going to be listening for from the press conferences that we're about to get in the next few minutes? Uh, if I'm honest, I don't think they're going to say very much about Brexit um, because the action was last night. They made their position quite clear. The information I'm waiting for as a Brexit geek is in the official written legal decision extending the uh, Article 50 process. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. Is it till midnight on the 11th of April or midnight on the 12th of April? Because no one in this building or the European Commission is quite sure what they've agreed to. Because the conclusions last night, the summit communique says until the 12th of April. Now, there's, some people think that means the Brexit cliff edge is midnight Brussels time on the 11th, which would be 11 p.m. London time, or it might be on the 12th. So which that's just one of those well, hilarious on, little moments of this whole process. That. So that, I mean, obviously, the UK side has to say whether it wants to be in the European elections, hence, for, hence a longer extension, because it can't have a longer extension if it's not in the European elections. It has to make that clear on the 12th. Uh, no, it has to make that clear at, at, up, up until the 12th. So the reason the 12th is an important date is because that is the point at which, as you were saying, the UK would have to decide it was going to participate in the European Parliament elections, yeah. which would be a prerequisite for a longer extension that went right. beyond the 22nd of May, or uh, if they were going to revoke Article 50 and stay in the EU as a, as a member permanently. So if you get to the 12th of April and the UK has done none of those things, does not have a plan that commands any support or approval here, and the deal has not passed, then no deal day is the 12th of April. It's just a question of whether it's actually midnight on the 11th of April or midnight on the 12th of April. And that question will be answered when we get the official legal decision in written form at some point this afternoon. And that's what leaders will adopt. It's one of the last things they do at the summit today is the official process of turning their, their conclusions, their written conclusions last night, which are a political document, into an actual piece of EU law that will say this is the new end date for Article 50. OK. If they've not made that clear to Theresa May, they're going to have to ring her because she's left the building. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Adam. I know you're
he'll come back and clarify those details for us. Well, we got some interesting detail yesterday from the Ministry of Defence in the UK that their planning operation for No Deal was underway and that a room had already been set out in the basement, in the bunker of the Ministry of Defence. We've seen plans at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in UK, which are also being unfolded. And there were rumours that the whole operation, which has been codenamed Operation Yellowhammer, is good to go on Monday. But it's been well documented that the UK side is well behind the preparations of the Netherlands. They've invested a lot of money in No Deal preparations, and Anna Holligan is in Rotterdam and has been taking a look. What have you we seen, are, Anna? Uh, we're on the port of Rotterdam, Europe's biggest port. Well, they're busy preparing, actually. Uh, this will be the new front line. So after the UK leaves the EU, this will be a hard border. Uh, the Dutch officials are taking us out to see their preparations because their policy since the start has been hope for the best and prepare for the worst. So uh, here you can see there are ships from all over the world transporting goods to and from the UK. In fact, Christian, there are 3,000 lorries making this journey across the channel every single day and after brexit they will be required to declare their loads their cargo in advance and if they don't then they will be refused access to the terminal so part of this trip is designed to raise awareness really uh, but they have uh, come up with contingency measures so They've built an extra 700 parking spaces for those lorries, businesses which haven't made their declarations. They will be turned away, told to get them in order. If they don't do that, within 24 okay. hours, they will be sent home. Anna, stay with us. We're just going to do a small technical thing and say goodbye to our viewers on BBC Two. If you want to stay with our Brexit coverage, we will be on the BBC News Channel. Let's go back to Anna. Fascinating, Anna, to see you moving around at Rotterdam Port there. Uh, Mark Rutter has made a, a lot of play of the fact that the Netherlands are gearing up for the no deal. They've invested a lot of money in it. How many staff, how many people do they have devoted entirely to this process? I mean, just customs staff alone, they're recruiting 900 extra customs officers. They didn't actually have enough vets here in the Netherlands, so they had to go overseas. They went to Belgium, they went to Southern and Eastern Europe to recruit enough vets. They then went through an 18-week Dutch language course to make sure they were able to operate effectively here at the ports. So for other nations looking at what the Dutch have done, they should bear in mind this hasn't all happened overnight. They've been preparing here for a year with these extra measures so that in the event of Britain leaving the EU without a deal, they have done as, as much as they believe they can do, on this side at least, to minimise the impact. But even then, they're expecting at least six weeks of uh, delays and, and hold-ups here because of the 3,000 or so trucks that use this port uh, every day, they think about 10 to 15% won't have their documents in order so that's about 400 every day that will be turned away and if one truck doesn't then effectively the hold-ups the tailbacks could go on for miles here yeah and you could of course replicate that picture there across all the ports around the uk in cali specifically of course a lot of the brexiteers anna would point to Rotterdam and say, look how Rotterdam works. It's one of the busiest ports in the world. Not everything is checked. Is there an answer to some of the technical solutions for the Irish border in the port of Rotterdam? Could some of those alternative arrangements already be there and copied from what they do there in the Netherlands? I mean, if you ask the Dutch, then yes, but uh, here they don't have to worry about quite as many of, as the, of the political uh, concerns as they do in the UK. So here they've introduced a system called Port Base, uh, which is actually a Dutch system. It's been in operation for years. And what they plan to do after uh, the UK leaves 
is ask other companies, countries who are planning to travel through the Netherlands is to register their cargo in advance on this digital system called Portbase uh, and that will allow the customs officers to register them, to be aware of them before they actually board the ferry. They will still have to do the checks though, the checks on the agricultural products, the checks on animals and food and that kind of thing and bearing in mind of course the Netherlands is the largest, second largest agricultural exporter in the world. So there is a huge amount coming from here in the Netherlands but also from right across the continent because Rotterdam is of course Europe's biggest port and it, I mean it, it doesn't stop here obviously. If I just move back to show you the scale of this, I don't know if we can come forwards a little and show you where we're going. So they just want to give us, give firms an idea of the challenges involved so that they can help to prepare and the Dutch government has invested a huge amount in making sure that they're ready. Yeah, fascinating to see all that. Compliments to the cameraman there. Isn't it amazing that we can broadcast from a live moving ship in a busy port like Rotterdam? Anna Holligan, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so. We are waiting for the press conferences. They were supposed to be at 12 o'clock, but the whole agenda, actually, of this summit has been pushed back. They turned, incidentally, to the European Union's relationship with China. And there is a row going on in the building right now between uh, the European Union and the Italians, because the Italians have Xi Jinping in Rome today. They're signing a deal with the Chinese on that Belt and Road project, investment in infrastructure in Italy. They're one of the only European countries to do that. Meanwhile, here at the European Council, the French and Germans, uh, side are pushing for the Chinese to be locked out of some of the public procurement. So you've got two approaches to China and maybe, maybe that round that is going on around the table over something entirely different to Brexit is delaying the whole show. But as I say, they are behind schedule. We will take you to those press conferences when we get it. Specifically, of course, uh, we want to hear from the German Chancellor Angela Merkel and the French President Emmanuel Macron. When we get those, we'll come back to Brussels. But for the moment, I'll hand you back. Let's go to Christian Fraser, who's covering this event for us in Brussels. Christian. Yes, thank you very much. Things are wrapping up here at the European Council Summit in Brussels. We're into that stage of the day where the leaders appear for their press conferences. In fact, I'm just watching here Angela Merkel, who has just appeared, the German Chancellor, setting out, as Simon just said to you there, the, the terms of uh, the deal that was agreed last night. So an unconditional extension until the 12th of April. Uh, there is also another date, the 22nd of May. If they were to pass Theresa May's deal, then they would have that technical extension until the 22nd of May to get all the legislation through. But that three-week period to the 12th of April effectively gives the House of Commons the space and the room to look at all the options. And what we're hearing from London this afternoon is that Parliament will try and force the Prime Minister Theresa May to hold indicative votes on all the options that might be there, maybe six or seven of them in the course of the next few weeks. Donald Tusk, the European Council President who came out to talk to us last night, said he was far more optimistic at the end of uh, their long discussions last night than he had been going into it. Here's our Europe correspondent, Damien Grammaticus. This morning, smiling, Angela Merkel visibly relieved. And Emmanuel Macron with a satisfied air. One EU leader said he slept well last night for the first time since the Brexit saga began. The reason they've given the UK a little more time, but set a definite deadline. Decisions must be made before European elections happen in May. If a country wants to leave the EU, then it would be beyond strange for it to still participate in the European elections. This is the prevailing view amongst my fellow leaders. What EU leaders have done is give the UK three weeks to come up with a clear decision. Either the UK must be out of the EU by the time European elections happen in May, or commit to taking part in those elections if it wants to stay in longer. For EU leaders, this is about insulating themselves and their elections from the fallout of Brexit. Mrs May texted EU leaders this morning to say she was skipping the rest of this summit, heading back to Westminster as a matter of urgency. During my breakfast I got an SMS from her that she won't be there because she's already in London, trying to convince the members of Parliament to 
to support the, the deal. We heard that European leaders last night, some of them were not reassured by what she said, that she could really get this through, that she had a plan that they could have confidence. She knows that she's dependent on the MPs. It's, it's, she, she lives in a democratic system where the MPs are free to vote how they, they want. And so she can't say here that she's, she has a guarantee that it goes through in London. But it seems after hearing the Prime Minister speak last night, some, like Emmanuel Macron, became even more sceptical she can get her deal through. So EU leaders decided to seize the initiative. Their advisers huddled, drafting the new deadlines, giving the UK one last chance to make up its mind what it wants from Brexit. I hope we can all agree we are now at the moment of decision. And I will make every effort to ensure that we are able to leave with a deal and move our country forward. How to move forward, though, is still open. What the EU's leaders have done is give a little time, clearing the way for Parliament to rethink, if it wants, the UK's whole approach to Brexit. All options will remain open and the cliff edge date will be delayed. The UK government will still have a choice of a deal, no deal, a long extension or revoking Article 50. That would mean deciding to stay in this club. But a no deal exit is also still possible as soon as just three weeks from now. Den Grammaticus, BBC News, Brussels. Damien Grammaticus reporting. We'll speak to Damien in a second. Uh, we are watching Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, picking out some of the important things that she's saying. We'll bring you all the news from that press conference. She said so far that we need certainty. Validity of the European parliamentary elections must not be undermined. And that is really a key point, Damien, is that if by the 12th of April the UK side has not found a way to proceed, they can't get a majority for one of those six or seven plans in the House of Commons, and they've not decided on whether they're taking part in the European elections, effectively effectively the 12th of April becomes the hard post. Yes, the, the UK has to now in those next three weeks from now until the 12th uh, chart a way forward. If it doesn't the 12th is the deadline. The 12th uh, of April is exit day, if, he, if in effect you like. It doesn't have to be because the UK can still agree to the, one of those other options. As the European leaders have been saying in the last few hours, it could rethink entirely, it could come back and say it wants something different and therefore wants a longer extension. But that all has to be clear by the 12th and by the 12th because the 12th is the date the UK has to commit to whether it takes part in the European elections in May or not. And if it wants that longer extension, if it wants a rethink condition, take part in the European elections. Such is the complexity of Brexit that <laughs> today the big debate within the room down here has been, well, is it midnight on the 11th or is it midnight on the 12th? Uh, the 12th important because it's the legal date by which the UK would have to inform the European Union according to UK law, that it was taking part. Interestingly, Angela Merkel is just listening to the opening of her press conference. She is talking about the 11th of April, I would presume, because they'd have to put things in place for another council summit. Well, I think because, they, yes, they need, if, if the UK, the UK's now got this little window uh, that's just been bought in this, at this summit, so delay, no cliff edge now at the end of next week, but first thing is Theresa May's deal, well, the deal that EU and Theresa May have negotiated, Will she be able to get that through? We don't know. Uh, second question, if she does, there's actually until they've said May to get through the, the legislation. But really, the question then comes back, what of all of those other options? And the other options are no deal, uh, seek a, a different type of deal in future, so customs union or single market or both, uh, and also uh, a new referendum, uh, an election in the UK. There's all sorts of things that could happen. Uh, Angela Merkel is saying, up over to the UK Parliament, you have these weeks to get that clarity. Hold that thought because Angela Merkel's talking about the preparations for no deal. Let's go across.
gut vorbereitet. Die deutsche Wirtschaft ist auch sehr gut vorbereitet. Die German Companies, I think, we are well prepared, um, as is the German business community. So I didn't see that as a I don't see this as a problem for the German um, economy. But obviously, um, a disorderly uh, um, Brexit or a no deal Brexit would not be the best possible solution. I said um, yesterday and previously um, that uh, I will try to bring this about until the very last hour, um, um, an orderly Brexit. But it depends now on the decision of the British Parliament. The British Parliament has decided with a majority that it does not want a no deal Brexit, and that is positive. Mr. Keller of RTL. Madam Chancellor, if I see it uh, correctly, in this agreement, um, you said um, everything hinges on a vote next week in the Parliament, but there may well be a fourth or fifth or seventh um, vote to be taken if the Speaker Berker allows it. Why did you only mention next week? And uh, building on this, before the 11th or 12th April, will then um, the British come again with new proposals? Is there a sufficiently high barrier? Um, I know it's speculative. Ich äh, antworte gerne auf die Frage, warum nächste Woche, weil Theresa May uns ja gesagt hat, dass es nächste Woche sein soll. Und deshalb haben wir Ihre Aussage and zum Maßstab genommen und gesagt, wenn diese Abstimmung dann stattfindet und well, es gäbe ein positives Votum, dann äh, würden wir Ihrer Bitte Good afternoon, für eine ladies and Sie hat ja gebeten in dem Brief um eine Verlängerung bis zum 30. Um, until the 30th of June. We then said there are certain legal ramifications and um, reservations, but we then allowed her the longest possible extension um, that is possible until, um, the, um, vote, uh, until the election on the 23rd of May uh, in order to make the best possible use of a longer um, period of time without interfering with the European elections. But obviously, should there be another proposal tabled, in the meantime, we will deal with it as is is our duty, but speculating about when this could be, what this can be, I don't think um, uh, is something that uh, will lead us uh, any further here. Um, we will have to wait and see. In the middle of the second row, the gentleman with the beard, well, Philip Zaus, um, on China again, as regards the economic relations um, that are perhaps of less importance, um, um, economically speaking, trade um, is all sometimes used as a lever in order to see to it that human rights um, are, um, are given their due respect. Um, and should one perhaps do this also with China um, and link this up um, with human rights, that is. Well, as you know, we have a very broad-based political platform um, on, on which we discuss and speak with um, China. There's a, a human rights dialogue, um, there is um, a rule of law dialogue, we're talking about this, we're also addressing specific um, cases. So this is part and parcel of a continuous uh, policy uh, with uh, China and has been. Mr. Preis from ID. Madam Chancellor, not a speculative um, question, just your impression. In a way, this is the last um, council meeting before uh, the date that has been fixed for Britain leaving the European Union. You have spent so many months uh, with the Prime Minister. How do you experience uh, meeting her? Do you feel that she still has um, things firmly under control? And um, how have you personally assessed your uh, comments yesterday night? Well, yesterday night we had a very candid talk as I said, with the Prime Minister, I think that she has put a lot of her efforts, a lot of her strength in... Um so Angela Merkel giving her thoughts there on the discussions in the room uh, last night. Let's take you straight away to Donald Tusk, the European Council President, who is also speaking in a different room. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you. And now President Juncker of the European Commission. Oui, Monsieur le Président, mes chers amis, nous n'avons pas seulement parlé du Royaume-Uni, mais aussi de la Chine. Je dois dire que le débat sur la Chine est autrement plus facile que le débat sur le Royaume-Uni. Non pas que la Chine voudrait joindre l'Union européenne, mais parce que la Chine ne nous quitte pas. Mais nous avons avec, euh, avec la Chine 
des relations, oui, comment dire, bonnes, mais qui ne sont pas euh, excellentes. La Chine, aujourd'hui, pour nous, est un concurrent, un partenaire, un rival. Pour nous, et donc, il faut s'ajouter à cette nouvelle donne de la vie euh, internationale. So, such is the confusion at the end of these European summits, all the leaders speaking at different times. We're getting different feeds from the European Broadcasting Union, and we'll keep across all those feeds and pull out the best bits of what they've been saying. I've got Damien Grammaticus with me. Um, there's still optimism. <laughs> Despite it all, there is still optimism on the European side that the House of Commons can find a way through this. Well, I think they do believe that there is possibly a sort of middle ground majority to be found, but they do also say this is a political process for the UK to resolve itself. The interesting thing is what they've done with their decision in the last 24 hours here is to create the space for Parliament to do that. They've taken off the pressure of an end of next week they made it three weeks uh, but that three weeks they're saying has to produce clarity and interestingly one thing I picked up from Angela Merkel uh, talking uh, just now uh, is she uh, does say or she has just said that she made very clear to Theresa May that the withdrawal agreement that exit treaty about which Parliament has had so many problems will not change that will not be reopened and, and, and altered but uh, Lars Rasmussen the Danish Prime Minister is saying look if you come back with another proposal you want a customs union you want a single market relationship whatever it is and you can move some of those red lines then the political declaration the non-binding part which is attached to withdrawal agreement that's open game we can we can look at all of that we can deliver a new package yes but a, but it's a crucial distinction between the two two documents uh, and I think this is one thing that might well, people might well have to sort of focus on in the coming days uh, if Parliament does hold indicative votes is the withdrawal agreement may still have to be attached to a number of the options in front of Parliament, in fact to, to many of them, uh, because the EU will still insist that deal is there on the table, that governs the exit, yes as you say, the Danish Prime Minister, others all indicating they can change that political declaration for a more ambitious, the EU by that means, closer future relationship, customs union, single market, but that's on top of the withdrawal agreement. Okay, stay with us. Let's go back to Jean-Claude Juncker. He's giving some thoughts. The out of the, um, the H billion, the, um, the European Union um, doesn't um, it only has access to 10 billion, so there's a lot of work to be done, which means that uh, there was an initial proposal in 2012, and then a proposal was made for um, international uh, procurement. I talked about this with heads of state and government this morning. Something else that's very important uh, is uh, a new framework for investment screening. This is a very important instrument which uh, will mean that uh, Europe um, has um, an economy that is open, but at the same time has the checks and balances in place to ensure that the same um, checks and balances to ensure that we are on a level playing field between all of the competitors on our market. Now, this screening mechanism is to enter into force on the 1st of April, I believe, this year. And if we had had this mechanism in place, we could have covered 83% of Chinese foreign direct investment in 2018. So this is a... a Major. We'll just come away from that press conference for a moment, but we'll keep a across it. He's actually talking about China. Uh, there's been a long discussion today about how they manage Chinese investment in the procurement process in the European Union. The interesting element to that, actually, is that Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, is in Rome at the moment, and the Italians are about to sign a deal with the Chinese, which takes them in a rather different direction to the path that the European Union has been setting out today. So that's why there's lots of questions on it. Damien is with me. Uh, I just want to pick up one final thought with you. The sticking point throughout this whole two-year negotiation has, of course, been the Irish border, the backstop, which would prevent a return to a hard border on the island of Ireland. 
If you were to make a decision, and a decision has never been made on a customs union, would that problem go away? The, uh, the idea is no. You'd need to have both a customs union and single market rules alignment uh, membership to really effectively deal with that problem. And the, the thought is, it, it would, it, Customs Union would help some, in going some ways, but not all the way, absolutely. Uh, so that is still a sort of problem, uh, you know, a stone that sits in the path of the, where The reason I ask that question is because this is the debate that's going to be unfolding over the course of the next few weeks. Do we need, does the UK, if it wants to get rid of the backstop problem, have to be closer to the single market and the customs union? At which point Brexiteers would say, well, what is the point? That doesn't look like leaving the European Union. Well, this is where you get the, the argument that, that what would be needed is a, what some people call Norway plus, that is Norway single market and plus customs union. Uh, and that, tie, that then ties you into not the political structures of the EU, you are outside that, you are outside other things too, you're outside the common agricultural policy, the fisheries policy, but you do have to sign up to uh, the single market rules, customs union would be on top, uh, but also free movement of people for freedoms you need to sign up to. Damien, thank you very much. I can see that we're going to have to revisit over the course of the next two weeks as these debates and these perhaps indicative votes take place. We're going to have to revisit all the options that are on the table and what it would mean uh, for the future trading relationship of the United Kingdom. There will be thoughts on all sides, of course. We will continue to keep across all these press conferences. We're still waiting to hear from the French President Emmanuel Macron, but for the moment, I will hand you back to London.